Hi everyone and uh, welcome back again. Uh, so this is our first panel session and the final event of the day. Um, and this is in collaboration with Patient Classification Systems International or PCSI as it's more commonly known. Uh, many of you remember that we held a very successful conference uh, with PCSI here in Sydney uh, a number of years ago. And um, I'm sure Alpha will mention that uh, PCSI is back on in person this year in Iceland, which I'm sure lots of people are looking forward to. So let me first introduce uh, today's facilitator, Alpha D'Amato, who is the CFO and Deputy Secretary at New South Wales Health, and in his spare time is the Vice President of PCSI. Um, Alpha, of course, is best known for leading the implementation of ABF in New South Wales Health um, and its evolution into activity-based management. So over to you, Alpha, and uh, the fantastic panel of people you've assembled. Thank you, James, and thank you to IPA. And I'm so excited to be here and introducing the panel. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the fact that there were members on the panel from everywhere in Europe and Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is the international perspective and application of activity-based funding. And uh, I think that is very uh, topical at the moment. Um, as James has mentioned, I'm Alfa D'Amato, and I'm joined today uh, by Denisa Maseska. Uh, we are both members of the executive committee of PCSI, and uh, I think that it's fair to say PCSI is like a family. It's been around for many, many years, Absolutely. and uh, and I think the 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 commitment to bring different, uh, um, if you want, leaders around ABF classification, costing, and funding is still alive. So much so that, uh, as James has mentioned, we are now. Uh, I'm going to have a conference, a face-to-face -face conference in Iceland in uh, September. And not only that, we have today uh, Goodman, who is actually from uh, Iceland. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel uh, members. Uh, first of all, we have from Denmark, Pernil. Uh, we have from Slovenia, Martina. Uh, we have from Iceland, Goodman. And uh, we have Brian from Ireland. And we have uh, from Saudi Arabia, Hiab. Um, again, um, I acknowledge the fact that it's early in the morning uh, for, for you guys in Europe and uh, it's probably getting nice and warm, which is excellent. And so good morning to you and uh, good afternoon to the audience. Um, so it's going to be like uh, when you watch the football. So <laughs> yeah. we're just going to provide <laughs> the narrative <laughs> and the commentary <laughs> and obviously, you know, feel free to intersect and ask questions to each other. But just to start with, I'd like to start with asking a question to Pernille. Peniel, uh, could you please introduce yourself, your organization and how ABF operates in your country? Yes, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Peniel Rosling. I'm head of department in the Danish Health Data Authority, um, where we are responsible for maintaining and developing the Danish DRG system. Um, we've been working with the uh, case mix for 20 plus years in Denmark and as uh, in 2021 we implemented a, a kind of ABF um, and has been working with that for 15 years but then five years ago we actually abandoned the overall ABF idea um, because we saw some some different um, incentives that that uh, we didn't want um, so so we're actually not working directly with the abf for now but we are working with case mix as a measurement tool that's excellent mm -hmm. excellent well to come back to the reason why you move away from abf of a funding tool but in the meantime why don't we go to martina martina same question to you Yes, good morning. Uh, I am Martina Zorko Kodelia and I work for the Health Insurance Institute of Slovenia, where I started as an intern 20 years ago. Uh, now I work in the department for the development and analysis of payment models, where my main task is to manage the DRG project, which I will talk about uh, later. For now, let me just say that the Health Insurance Institute is the only provider of compulsory health insurance in the country and that we are the payer of all healthcare services. So we have an insurance based health system. Uh, regarding case mix, we adopted Australian DRG system, including Australian weights in 2004 and we only upgraded it once in 2013 to version 6 
which is still in use today. Um, we use the DRG system for acute hospital treatments, although some specific inpatient services like um, transplantations or psychiatric inpatient treatments are paid on the basis of cases or hospital days, respectively. To make it easier for you to imagine the size of Slovene DRG system, we have just little more than 2 million inhabitants. We have 19 public and 9 private hospitals. Uh, together, they make uh, around 350,000 cases per year and our uh, health insurance institute pays from health insurance around 655 million euros for uh, DRGs, which is approximately 40% of total healthcare services costs that we cover. Thank you. Thanks, Martina. That's very interesting. Or to come back to you in, uh, in the fact that uh, you only updated the weight uh, over the last probably what, nearly 20 years twice. Which is very interesting. And the fact that you're using the Australian weights, it's very, very interesting. But why don't we move to here? Yeah, do you want to give us an update on where you are up to? Sure, sure. Uh, allow me to introduce myself quickly. Habala Tassi, I'm um, Executive Director of the National Case Mix Center of Excellence in the Kingdom. And allow me just to highlight that uh, uh, this center is uh, one of its kind in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so, uh, and it uh, has been recently established uh, during the uh, COVID uh, times, unfortunately. Um, so just let me highlight basically what's happening in Saudi Arabia. Um, we're having a, a mass um, uh, transformation and reforms in the, in the health sector, mainly moving towards um, value-based healthcare. Uh, and just to give you a glimpse about Saudi Arabia, uh, our population is uh, almost 34 million. Um, uh, one third of them covered by the uh, private insurance uh, 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 sector, meaning um, it depends on their employment. So if they are employed within the um, uh, uh, private sector, then their employers are obliged to um, uh, insure them under private insurance um, uh, coverage. Uh, the remaining are covered under the public uh, sector. Uh, in, in the in the private sector, well, the the relationship between the insurance and the private hospitals uh, mainly was um, 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 fee for service. Uh, however, just recently, last year, we started to embed and inject um, um, uh, DRG based payment. Um, uh, on the other hand, in the in the public sector. Uh, the funding still uh, in, in global or block budgets. However, we have designed an interesting um, a funding mechanism. Uh, let me highlight uh, that the, the Ministry of Health used to play a role as a regulator, payer, and a provider. And the first step of that transformation is to segregate these three functions from each other. So we have um, um, established um, um, a national single payer to fund the public hospitals. And the public hospitals, we decided to corporatize them and cluster them. Um, so we have divided the kingdom into 20 um, uh, different uh, catchment areas or geographical areas. Uh, each one of them, uh, we call them cluster, and the cluster mainly is a identified catchment area with identified population uh, uh, and attached to it healthcare facilities um, where it has all the level of uh, um, uh, care, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And uh, therefore, um, we designed the funding mechanism in the public system in two different layers. From the single payer to the uh, um, cluster management is going to be population based and uh, according to the, um, uh, their risk profiles. Um, the second layer, which is intraclusterly within the cluster between the um, cluster management and the healthcare facilities, is going to be blended uh, um, uh, payment mechanism, uh, mainly constituted by the uh, ABF uh, activity based funding, and of course, attached to it um, outcome KPIs just to advocate for the um, uh, value of base healthcare. And uh, similar to the um, Slovenian um, uh, uh, system or case mix, um, uh, we have adopted also the uh, Australian um, uh, classification system. So um, uh, uh, we are following the ICD 10 AM uh, uh, for the clinical codes, uh, ACHIs for the procedure codes, and um, for the case mix, um, um, uh, ARDRGs version 6. Um, this is where are we right now. 
Excellent. Thank you. That's very encouraging to see how much progress you made. And in particular, I'd be interested to talk about how you have integrated all your hybrid model, where you have a population base and an ABF model uh, running simultaneously. But let's go back to that. Now, why don't we go to Goodman? Goodman, you are about to host the next PCS side. Sell it to us. Uh, thank you, Alpha. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is uh, Goodman Olofsson. Uh, I'm a senior advisor at the Minister of Health in Iceland, and uh, I work in the Department of uh, Budget and Administration on the budget side. Uh, I initially come from the banking sector, and among others, I worked for the Central Bank of Iceland for six years. And uh, since joining the ministry five years ago, my focus has uh, mainly been uh, the hospital sector, where I work closely with our two main hospitals in the capital area and uh, Akureyri Hospital in the north of the country. Um, Iceland has a small population of around uh, 370,000 and uh, the healthcare system is mainly a public one or around uh, 90%. Uh, the hospital sector has historically been uh, block funded and uh, about 10% uh, of the budget goes to uh, hospital services. Uh, for the last two years, I've been a part of implementing funding for hospital services by using uh, DRGs or case mix. And uh, of course, one of our main goals in Iceland, as uh, in other countries, is to uh, provide good healthcare to our citizens. And uh, as you all know, uh, healthcare costs are going up and demand is growing enormously. And uh, we have the uh, demographic changes, uh, technological innovation, new treatments, uh, new medicines and new devices. and uh, I think you know the list. Uh, all of these uh, contribute to more demand uh, on the system. And then on the other hand, we have limited resources like human and uh, financial resources. So we need uh, increased efficiency, uh, transparency and predictability so we can uh, do better planning for the future. And uh, we believe that improved budget planning is one of the many advantages and reasons for adapting our new uh, GRT based uh, funding system. Uh, but aside from the uh, implementation work, uh, this year my focus has shifted uh, a bit to the rural areas of Iceland outside of the capital area, uh, where approximately 30% of the Icelandic population lives. I am working with the health uh, institutions that manage uh, the six health districts outside the capital area. And uh, this is a bit different uh, from working with the hospitals, uh, both in size and also in the operation as the uh, institutions provide both the uh, primary and then secondary hospital care uh, along with uh, managing some of the long-term care in the districts. But uh, all the tertiary care is provided uh, at the two main hospitals in Reykjavik and in Akureyri. Uh, in the end, I would also like to mention, like uh, Alpha said, that uh, for the last half year, I've had the pleasure of being a part of the local organizing committee for the 35th annual PCSI conference to be hosted by the Ministry in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, this September 27th to 30th. Uh, this will be uh, an in-person event and uh, I hope many of you find the opportunity to come and visit us and enjoy what the conference offers. The theme uh, will be case mix as a foundation for sustainable health management and uh, you can find uh, all the relevant information on our website PCSI Reykjavik uh, 2022.is or just uh, PCSI.is. And of course, if there is anything, you can just contact us. Uh, but uh, thank you for having me and uh, I look forward to being here with you uh, for the next hour. Excellent. Thank you, Goodman. Uh, that is excellent. I'm very excited about what you think. Is, are we going to make it to Iceland this Absolutely. year? Absolutely. We were just saying before that, um, you know, we love the technology. It's fantastic. It's kept us all, uh, you know, networking over this time. But there's nothing like getting together like Alpha and I are right now. That's exactly <laughs> right. Sitting here <laughs> right over here. So, Brian, what do you think? What is that? Do you want to give us a bit of a um, rundown of what you have to up in Ireland? Uh, and, and like you, I'm certainly looking forward to, to meeting up in person again in Reykjavik. Um, so yeah, Brian Dunham is my name. Um, I'm the Assistant Chief Financial Officer for Costing and Pricing uh, within the Healthcare Pricing Office in Ireland, which is part of the Health, health Service Executive 
which I guess is similar to the NHS in the UK. So the Department of Health in Ireland have responsibility for policy. Uh, the HSE implement that policy. And essentially we're funder and provider of all public health services and an emphasis on the public there we, because we get no data or information from the private hospitals, yeah. which became an issue during COVID, which uh, we'll mention later. Um, so I've probably been over 20 years in, in, the, in the case mix area. I think my first PCSI conference was in 1997. So <laughs> another plug for PCSI. Um, but what I would say about those conferences is, is they've been a great way to, to meet people, engage and learn from other countries, so I certainly would in, encourage it. Um, so the Healthcare Pricing Office, um, which, which I head up, has responsibility for the main components uh, of, of ABF, so basically for ABF, and that includes responsibility for, for costing, uh, setting prices, uh, coding, training the coders, the hospital coders within the system. So again, that's carried out by ourselves. Um, we have an IT function headed up by um, the secretary of PCSI, Brian McCarthy. Um, we're also responsible for, for data quality, data analytics, uh, freedom of information requests, PQs, etc. Uh, in Ireland, we have a population of approximately 5 million. Um, we have 48 acute public hospitals, uh, of which 43 participate in the ABF programme. Uh, we will be trying to get the other hospitals in over the next couple of years. Uh, we're state funded system. Our total budget is 21 billion euros, of which approximately 7 billion of that relates to the acute sector. Um, the scope of ABF in Ireland is admitted care, which accounts for about 1.7 million cases. Um, we use um, the Australian DRG system and have done so since, uh, since 2006. Um, and I think certainly that has been a great assistance to us, been, been able to, to, to learn from our colleagues without reinventing the wheel. Um, we do hope to bring in ED and outpatients into the ABF arena. And again, we're looking at the Australian URG system and we've started, commenced a pilot in Ireland on that, collecting the data in the short list of ICD-10. We've taken again the outpatient classification from Australia and again adapted it for, for Irish practice. And I think that's important if you are taking uh, another country's system, you do have to adapt it for your own, for your own needs. Um, but I think as, a, as the concept and the, the background behind it, it's a very good starting point. Um, I suppose the policy around ABF has been your, your typical, you know, fairness, equitable, transparency, efficiency. Um, we do create, a, you know, part of the output is a, is a price list each year, which as, as well has been used for funding. Um, we also use for um, the EU treatment abroad scheme. So again, within the EU, you can, you can get health services in any country and we will pay uh, up to the level of the price we would pay in Ireland. Um, so that's just a kind of a quick background of, of what we do in Ireland. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. I was just um, going to make a comment. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comparisons uh, across, uh, you know, different people. Um, so we've got, you know, large populations, very large populations in the case of uh, Saudi and some very small uh, populations in the case of Iceland. We've got uh, different models, so health insurance uh, based, you know, funding and then uh, the publicly funded, so the beverage and Bismarck models. We've got uh, recent implementation versus more established implementation and even de-implementation <laughs> in one instance, which we're you know, keen to hear a little bit more about. We've got different organisations involved and different areas of focus like uh, you know, the rural area, uh, for example. Uh, but I think one of the commonalities mm. in all of them is the Australian classifications. Indeed, I, <laughs> right. I think probably from that, I, I guess my other question is about how have, we, how have you adapted case mix to, if you want, face the pandemic? So what were the opportunities and challenges uh, using case mix? So, uh, Peniel, you mentioned that uh, case mix is now used as a, a measurement. Was that approach useful? What did you do in the pandemic? How do you think it is uh, has created a challenge, if you want, or an opportunity? Well, actually, we we suspended all work with case mix during the pandemic because uh, quickly we saw that that we couldn't get the um, the live data we needed for monitoring the pandemic. So we actually we changed focus during the pandemic and started collecting data in another way. Um, and again, we suspended all uh, 
all financial uh, sensibility, um, just spending money to uh, to break the pandemic. Uh, so actually, we we are now facing. Uh, the challenge of how to get back on track because even though we don't use the uh, case mix for abf purposes uh, we use it for measurement tools and we we calculate uh, tariffs and weights every year uh, based on on uh, last year's uh, budgets and and accounts uh, but now we don't have we don't have uh, normal accounts uh, for the past two years because we have had very low activity and and very high costs um so so now we are struggling to find the the right uh, costing model um, so that's basically our challenge because we haven't really uh, used case mix during the pandemic that's that's very interesting have you considered using the australian Classification and weight. <laughs> We're not telling anything here. No, that's right. We're not. I will try to be smart. Okay. You're on commission, <laughs> Alpha. <laughs> well, that's interesting because I guess that's pretty much the challenge for everyone. You know how the data has been impacted by you know the pandemic and what is the new the new starting point. Certainly, something yeah. that are a challenge here in Sydney and also in New South Wales. So let's ask the same question to uh, Martina. Do you, you, how did you um, how did you go with case mix in uh, in the COVID, and uh, how do you see the opportunities uh, uh, of using uh, case mix going forward? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a few challenges in mind. Uh, the first challenge was how to calculate the cost of treating a patient with COVID at all uh, in 2020. Uh, our Ministry of Health calculated prices for three different services. One was uh, treatment of COVID uh, patients without complications. The other was treatment of, co of COVID patients with complications. And the third one was treatment uh, of COVID patients with a ventilator. And the billing of these services was done by case and not through the DRG system. But then in 2021, when we had more data, more cost data, the, the treatment processes were um, um, established and firm. Uh, then uh, our institute uh, did the cost analysis and calculated new prices, uh, which were considerably lower than the, uh, the ones from the 2020. And the payment uh, went through the DRG uh, system in the way that we paid the price of the um, uh, basic uh, DRG that is calculated. Uh, and uh, if one of diagnosis is COVID, we pay a supplement to the basic uh, price. Uh, so this is how we are paying for the COVID patients right now. Then uh, the second challenge is similar to what Pernil mentioned. Um, uh, due to the pandemic, certain services uh, from hospitals were not provided to patients because hospitals primarily treated COVID patients and a lot of other treatments were cancelled. Let me just say that in 2020, 13% uh, fewer cases were handled by hospitals than the year before, for example. Uh, as a result of that, uh, the, the waiting lines or queues, I'm not sure what the English term is, uh, have been prolonged. Uh, and today, and for a couple of next years, we face the challenge on how to get back on track, uh, how to shorten these uh, waiting lines, and um, our Health Insurance Institute um, provides financial incentives for carrying out those services where waiting times or lines are uh, the longest. And it is up to the hospitals to optimize their operation and provide a larger number of these uh, services. Uh, another challenge maybe sounds uh, minor, but I will still mention it, is the auditing of the um, coding of mm. COVID uh, patients. Uh, one thing was due to the pandemic, our auditing physicians 
could not carry out the audits um, on location, which they usually do. Um, uh, they go directly to the hospital and uh, take the medical documentation and check uh, what's written in the documentation against uh, what was uh, coded. Um, uh, so uh, these uh, uh, audits uh, on locations were only possible from the June last year onwards. And um, what did they find out? Um, that uh, the billing errors uh, found out uh, by the auditors include uh, mainly excessive coding, so that means that uh, unjustified coding of additional diagnosis. And uh, the other uh, error, uh, major error was misdiagnosis. For example, where COVID-19 was um, recorded as the primary diagnosis, but actually the patient was treated primarily for some other condition and experienced only mild or asymptomatic uh, COVID. Um, so, um, what did we find found out, uh, what was the challenge, that the instructions about how to code this new disease uh, needs to be clearly defined and communicated properly with hospitals. So, these were some of the challenges that popped to mind. Oh, that's very interesting. Thank you, Martina. Um... And look, I'll be quick, I'll be interested in uh, in discussing how you see the case mix helping you out with the long wait. Uh, we have the same problem, and I presume everyone has experienced the same challenges. So, what, yeah, uh, do you want to give us a bit of uh, insight, given the status of the implementation, and in particular in respect to the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, you have this hybrid model, a population and ABF model. What are the challenges and opportunity after COVID? So, so let me start with uh, with what challenges that we have faced uh, during the COVID uh, for the case mix. Basically, uh, like any other country, um, there was a lot of skewness in the behavior of the activities. So uh, it was uh, really difficult uh, to follow um, um, uh, uh, to do costing uh, uh, following the normal behavior of the activities. That's why, unfortunately. Um, most of our costing studies or costing exercises that we have conducted all of them we use 2019 data because we think this is the the proper behavior uh, of the market um however um let me talk about the fertilities uh, during that time um uh, we took the advantage in the implementation um, especially while we were trying to capture all the, the uh, uh, population uh, who are vaccinated, uh, there was a lot of platform integration in our system, uh, especially um, uh, between the private sector and the uh, and the uh, public sector, uh, and that also gave us the chance to standardize um, uh, uh, our minimum data set and uh, our coding system and, and uh, our coding standards. Um, all of that um, uh, started to um, um, provide us in a later stage more meaningful um, uh, uh, information and data that can help uh, in case mix decision. Um, uh, another um, um, uh, opportunity uh, that we have seen um, uh, during uh, the COVID, uh, we managed to take the historical um, 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 uh, coded data uh, especially uh, we had issues in the um, uh, quality of coding. So we, we captured all the historical data and we start to do uh, like a real um, robust uh, um, auditing for that. And uh, uh, we provided um, um, uh, feedback for the ecosystem, how to improve uh, uh, the coding quality. And once um, the, the end of the COVID era, uh, we really managed to um, improve the quality of coding rapidly um, so this is yeah this is what we have managed to um, um uh, take advantage of during the COVID times now back to your question regarding the uh, hybrid model um we, we are eager to have as i told you the the first layer between the single payer and the cluster to to be more a population-based funding because we need to incentivize the ecosystem, basically, especially the payer and the provider represented in the, uh, um, uh, in the cluster in this case, um, uh, to keep an eye on the population health 
and uh, to uh, measure and score the, the, the population health in a scientific way and in a standardized way. Um, uh, and this is in order to, uh, first of all, to advocate for the value-based healthcare and also in, in, in order to make sure that uh, uh, we can intervene in the right preventative intervention at the right time. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, uh, and that's why um, uh, we were eager to um, um, embed and inject the population health funding. And this is what we think also what uh, uh, the ABF needed to complement it with. That's very good. Uh, it's interesting the comment that you made around, you know, the, the population based funding, because it is something that we we, we do here yeah, in uh, New South Wales to a degree. Uh, but that's uh, that's very useful. Uh, look, I do want to go to Goodman, in particular in regards not only the challenges and uh, opportunities with case mix. Obviously, you are still at the beginning of the journey, but in particular around how you are inter if you are integrating the small hospitals or the rural hospitals in this journey. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's correct. Uh, we had uh, not implemented case mix fun uh, funding uh, when the pandemic started, but uh, like in uh, when we were in the first wave of COVID, uh, we started to work uh, with McKinsey company on building uh, a reimbursement system uh, for the hospital services. And uh, this would be to a large extent built on case mix. Uh, it is a mixed six system, so uh, it's not only uh, based on case mix. Uh, we finished this work in 2020, uh, but uh, the like the implementation plan starting uh, in 2021, that was like the real challenge. Uh, I mean, the main stakeholders were busy with uh, COVID related tasks. Uh, so we were like pushed one year uh, back, uh, although we managed of course to do a lot of tasks in 2021. But, uh, and uh, in the end we uh, funded uh, all the extra cost uh, through the uh, block uh, funding system with, uh, with extra funding, but uh, the problem here uh, that you mentioned with the uh, rural uh, hospitals uh, in the implementation is, of course, that, uh, as I told you, it's a very uh, small population. And uh, so we have this uh, six institutions that uh, not only uh, do uh, hospital services, but also primary care and the uh, long term care. And so we have this problem of uh, <coughs> What we need to do now uh, is one of the uh, part of the implementation plan that we have now is that we are uh, have to go through the uh, to speed up uh, the clinical coding at uh, uh, at these uh, institutions uh, that are not up to speed today, and uh, you also have to make their financial reporting more harmonized so so we can compare apple to apple you know and uh, can analyze and in the end uh, decide if and how much of the institution's uh, hospital services should be really financed by using case mix or uh, drgs oh, that's very interesting you see i, I think that uh, your challenges uh, with the small hospitals in the rural areas are uh, probably not unique to Iceland. Uh, I feel that uh, probably in New South Wales has some similar challenges and not that probably other countries, whether, you know, in Saudi or, you know, Ireland. Uh, but with that said, why don't we go to Brian? Brian, so challenges and opportunities. You've been... Yeah, so... Far. <laughs> so certainly there was there was challenges, uh, Alpha. So obviously um, we, we we had to revert to block funding for 2021 20, 22, uh, primarily due to the drop in activity um, and increased expenditure due to due to the COVID. Um, we probably dropped about two hundred thousand cases against our plan. So when I mentioned one point seven million cases earlier, it's quite 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 a drop. We also obviously did the increased costs and one of the challenges for us was some of the increased expenditure took place at the national level, not necessarily all in the hospital level, but some did. So we had variation into where COVID expenditure was recorded. Um, so the, the costing has been a challenge. Um, notwithstanding that, we did proceed with the uh, the normal ABF process. So um, Mark and his team would have 
completed the costing, we, we did the benchmarking, um, which showed us obviously that the, the base cost had increased um, qu quite substantially due to the, the increased expenditure and reduced activity. Um, we did get in, into an arrangement with the private hospital. So I mentioned previously we had no engagement with private hospitals. So um, when when COVID started, nobody kind of knew what was going to going to happen. So there was certainly a policy of empty the hospitals and take whatever capacity you can. So uh, we took over the, the private hospitals for three months, um, which was basically a cost recovery model hook for for the entire cost of the private hospitals um, so that so that was expensive it only lasted for three months we then went to a fee for service where we were guaranteed a capacity um, but we had to pay retainer payments if we didn't use it now one of the advantages of of having the uh, ABF data was it allowed us to benchmark uh, the, the cost that we were being charged in relation to the private so so I think that was certainly um, you know been very useful we were obviously keen to keep the the tools you know the whole process going because we, we were mindful of what happens post COVID um, that uh, if, if you turn off the switch or you give the message that ABF isn't happening then it's very hard to turn that back on so mm -hmm. I think that was certainly uh, some of the of, of the challenges uh, around the opportunities um, as I say I, I think the probably the big one is is that the vaccination system um, brought in a, an individual health identifier so that's something that we've been really chasing in, in, in the context of you know being able to follow the patient journey uh, not just through the hospital but into the wider health system um, and that had been kind of you know in in the pipeline for a number of years but never got over the line um, so a, an individual health fire was health identifier was brought in for the vaccination system which now I think has given great impetus to move that uh, back into the, the, the wider health system um, so the um, I, I suppose other things that we we, we kept on going was obviously the coding and I have to compliment um, Australia in relation to how quickly the codes came out for, for COVID because it was great pressure to kind of you know get some information around the uh, the COVID activity and what was actually happening in hospitals so our data collection was very good in relation to that we brought in coding within 48 hours for COVID cases which formed part of the overall uh, reporting on COVID so we had essentially a data lake of, of all the information feeding into um, uh, around COVID so uh, our coded data was used particularly for the ICU data in relation to finding out the you know the profiles of patients in relation to age how long they were spending in ICU where they were coming from where they were going to so it was certainly uh, I, I think the you know the currency of our coded data uh, increased during the um, during the COVID we also had to code the cases from the private hospital. So our, our team in the HPO were, were coding uh, from claim forms because obviously this is displaced activity from the public system. So, um, and we still have those arrangements in place with the private hospitals. Um, and uh, I've been heavily involved in that process as have some of my team. So um, it has given us a focus on the private hospitals that hopefully will lead to a, a situation where, you know, we, we start getting them to code their activity because, you know, not just for ABF, but also from a, you know OECD reporting. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it Brian, from the Irish side. Thank you. That's very useful. Two questions from the audience uh, yeah. relating to what you just mentioned. One is that uh, what type of uh, adaptation did you have to make to the uh, Australian, you know, uh, data Australian classification? And I recall one that ended up on the front pages many years many years ago. So you could start with that. Was it the shark attack or the spiders? The, <laughs> the shark attack. Fill me in. Um, no, look, I mean, obviously, um, I, I suppose some of the changes in, in relation to when we took on the classification system from, from Australia, we would have taken the Australian weights. Um, and obviously, you don't, you don't fund um, blood, I think, and, and, and drugs are subsidised. So we had to go to New Zealand for that initially. Um, we obviously got, we have patient level costing in place now, so so we don't have to do that. I think certainly in relation to, I think we, we, we would certainly have more um, treated as admitted care than you would have. A lot of those would be your uh, in your outpatient area. So certainly in relation to, um, we would a lot more same day DRGs as well. Um, in, in Ireland and, and possibly Australia. 
Um, we've changed some of the, uh, the rules around cancer um, patients just around um, because we treat them as admitted care. So um, I think it is important to kind of have your own cost data. Um, it's good to take weights initially just to get started. And I think that's certainly one of the key learnings. You know, don't wait for perfection that, um, you know, just, just get started because that will tell you a lot as well um, in, in relation to, to the issues. But um, yeah, so certainly the, um, the, the whole kind of same day, day case area. And we, we do have a challenge around that kind of day case outpatient area it's a gray area in a lot of cases yeah. uh, and it does cause some issues around you know whether we should be paying uh, different rates for for outpatients and day case when it's for, for what is essentially the same the same treatment so that's why we're keen to get outpatients into the into the picture so um and, and indeed so we're covering all areas and there's no there's no kind of incentive over one area over the other awesome very good yeah, thank you, Brian. I was just going to make a comment, uh, just, uh, you know, people talking about COVID. So, you know, people, uh, you know, took a pause and, you know, did some different things, but it's really overhauled everything, hasn't it? It's not like you can go back uh, and pick up, you know, what you had before, because the new normal, as everyone keeps saying, might look completely different, you know, in the future. So your weights, your costing, your classifications, even this movement, you know, between inpatients, outpatients, uh, you know, for example, um, everything will change or has changed. Tell me I think occupancy levels as well, Denisa. So certainly our occupancy levels, because you just couldn't, from an infection control point of view, have the same level of um, of occupancy as, as you would have had previously. So so that's why we sort of had to resort to the to the private hospital area to, to get additional capacity to compensate for the loss of occupancy within the within the public system. It's very interesting we have to do the same here. And I yes. guess that probably is a common theme. And um, well, what about we going back to Penny? Penny, a lot of questions about data quality. And I'm mindful that uh, your case mix is about measurement. Therefore, how are you going about data quality? And even more important in that environment. Um, well, we, we have had a long history of collecting data even before we started working with case mix. Uh, we have had have a national patient registry back from 1977. Um, so, so that was, uh, it's never been a big issue for us because we, we've, uh, we collected data and we have a, we believe to have a, a high data quality, uh, but actually it, it, it's been part of, of why we've uh, abandoned the ABF um, because we've seen a, a shift in, in coding, um, basically upcoding. Um, when, when, uh, when we started uh, analyzing um, why we didn't get the, the raise in productivity we wanted uh, from, from the whole ABF work, mm. uh, we started seeing that that there were um, we were just over treating patients. It was not a raise in in uh, the number of patients uh, treated, but there was a raise in 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 cases in GAG cases per patient. Um, so I mean it's 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 kind of a data quality issue. It's maybe it's more of a incentive issue, um, giving us data quality. Uh, problems, um, but, but we, we now try to uh, uh, to uh, change the whole way of, of uh, collecting data and, and, and the way we code uh, so so we can sort of uh, stop this uh, upcoding. So a question from the audience, they want to know whether you have uh, clinical coders and HIMS or uh, uh, you have clinicians or um, you know, doing the coding ICD. It's the clinicians that are doing the coding. We don't have any professional coders. We have secretaries supporting the clinicians, but in the end, it's the clinicians uh, that decide which codes to put into the system. Oh, very interesting. And I was just going to make a comment on, uh, you know, you talked about upcoding and whether that is actually upcoding versus better recording finally, um, you know, yeah. I think I think it's difficult to need. You know, there's I suppose when when the ABF is introduced, there's a kind of you bring in the coding up to a level, yeah. and I suppose it's where that level stops and does it go beyond what what is uh, 
what is appropriate and and I think it goes back to Martina's piece around, you know, having an audit process in place, um, I, I think is is key. And that's something that we missed out in the COVID, that you couldn't have people going uh, on, onto hospital sites. Um, but I think ha having measures to, to compare hospitals, um, both from a coding quality perspective, is, is very helpful. And um, we certainly invested a lot in the whole data quality side and being able to monitor um, you know, hospitals, because there's an expectation of certain hospitals should be at certain levels based on their on their size and, and structure. Uh, and where you see spikes that don't make sense, I think that's where, you know, you, you have to kind of chase them, you know, to send the auditors in. But you can't audit every chart and, and yeah. auditing is expensive. Yeah. Um, but I think it is important to have that measure of control in place, um, you know, to ensure fairness, because ultimately, if somebody is upcoding, they're taking a share off somebody else mm -hmm. uh, inappropriately. So let's go back to the data quality. And I'm particularly interested in uh, Martina's experience about the audit challenges that you mentioned before. Uh, do you have any any approaches that uh, build quality incentives into your price or the tariffs? Um, I'm um, particularly interested about the comment that you made about when you went back and costed the activity and uh, you find out it was much cheaper or you know, costed less than you paid. Um, yes, uh, let me explain. Um, we do not yet have any incentives for uh, quality embedded in our system, but uh, um, on the basis of the billing data that we receive from hospitals, and these data are um, very uh, detailed, um, we receive the data about all the diagnosis, all the procedures, all the length of stay, uh, the personal uh, data of the, the patient, uh, and so on. Um, on the basis of this data, we do calculate some quality indicators. Um, we just started doing that. So uh, at the moment, uh, we send the results to uh, hospitals, uh, and we decided to give them about a, year, a year's time to uh, try to improve these uh, quality uh, issues uh, at respective hospitals. Uh, it is planned to um, attach these quality indicators to uh, the payment uh, of the hospital uh, services. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention, uh, uh, at the beginning I said that we are, I am managing the DRG project. Uh, and one of the tasks of this project is to, um, uh, uh, to prepare together with the hospitals a methodology for recording costs of um, their uh, services. And uh, we want them to record as much costs as possible to the specific uh, patient. Uh, so that on the basis of this data, we will be able to recalculate the weights of uh, each uh, DRG. Um, I don't know, is that enough? Should I say something? Yeah, no, more? no, that's great. No, no, that's great. In fact, I think that's probably goes to the challenge of how um, case mix funding uh, uh, adapts or if you want to different uh, circumstances. And probably a question that we got from the audience for you here. Uh, the question is, how does Saudi Arabia fund models handles the influx of, uh, um, you know, the 5 million people visiting Saudi, uh, the Saudi Arabia once a year? Uh, I didn't realize that, that you have so many pil pilgrims. Oh, yeah. So, so regarding the pilgrims, um, um, well, we have uh, two type of uh, pilgrims. Um, one of them, uh, um, uh, they, um, uh, they um, visit uh, uh, Saudi Arabia around the whole year. And these are basically, um, they are uh, um, uh, uh, funded, uh, uh, well, they have to insure uh, through insurance-based uh, funding. Um, uh, the other type of pilgrims, that the ones that they come uh, uh, once a year uh, for Hajj, um, um, uh, this is basically funded through the government. Um, uh, it's it's a, like a, a sensitive um, um, uh, area because um, um, uh, the, our central government is eager to um, um, fund all the these kind of pilgrims 
um, uh, as a part of um, a funded mandate um, uh, a budget uh, within the, the kingdom. So, uh, yeah, and uh, actually, uh, honestly, uh, Alpha, we see a lot of um, 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 uh, special cases. Uh, for example, um, some people, they take appointment from their countries uh, in, in our, uh, for example, one of our primary health care. And, um, uh, and um, uh, they do many elective uh, um, 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 uh, surgeries or um, uh, cold cases that uh, get treatment for cold, uh, for cold, cold cases. And I, I remember one case, uh, there was um, uh, someone who uh, changed uh, their knee um, uh, um, uh, uh, during the um, uh, pilgrim season. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, this is one of the real challenges that we have um, uh, uh, in the kingdom. And uh, still we're trying to find uh, some ways how to deal uh, with it. Uh, and uh, the, the other, the other uh, challenge for that also, it's not easy to capture data through that very intense and condensed season. Um, um, uh, Five million, they are, uh, 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 they are visiting the kingdom within uh, 13 days. Um, and there will be a lot of uh, treatment and services in, in a very um, 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 uh, small area relatively. So um, to capture all that data, uh, still um, um, we are not there yet. Uh, we just recently proposed some solutions how to um, uh, to take it, uh, following the 80-20 uh, rule um, uh, uh, to capture the most uh, um, um, and uh, uh, easily coded uh, cases uh, uh, at the first stage. And this is uh, and we have a plan how to um, evolve the quality uh, uh, of data during the uh, the season. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. Um, going back to Goodman, Goodman, I guess, uh, you know, um, there is a question, a thread, if you want, coming from the audience about virtual care. Have you done much in Iceland about virtual care? We uh, have uh, some projects going uh, with uh, virtual care. Of course, uh, I think uh, one of our problems uh, is that uh, uh, the beds in our hospitals are occupied by people that should maybe be not be in on hospital. So we are working on uh, more home care and uh, with that also more uh, virtual care. And uh, we have been in, uh, working with a Nordic platform in this to get ideas. And uh, but we are, I would say we are in the uh, maybe in the beginning stages of uh, managing it, but uh, we have put extra funds into this and uh, also been uh, advocating for uh, innovation uh, in uh, apps and uh, other uh, helpful uh, uh, aids uh, to keep uh, help people to stay uh, more at home. And also, of course, we need to have this in place because we are uh, a seafaring nation and uh, have uh, a lot of people working mm -hmm. in the ocean. So you would have to have some uh, uh, telemedicine uh, uh, opportunities to uh, uh, work with them when something happens happens uh, far away from shore. Well, that's very interesting. Thanks. That's a, that's a good perspective. And I presume that kind of applies to a little bit uh, everyone. Uh, but Neil, what is the, the current take on virtual care? Is there one of those the innovation big topic or is it like ABF is gone in the past? <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> no, it is one of the, the, the very hot uh, subjects because um, we need more virtual care, uh, both because it's uh, efficient and it's what the patient wants. Um, but, but actually we, we are struggling with the basic definition of virtual care because mm. We also see virtual care where there's the, the, the clinician and the patient is not uh, online at the same time. We see patients uh, sending in uh, test results virtually and then 
hours later the clinician is looking at the the results so so how do we get the how do we we define a virtual care episode so that's actually where we're struggling right now but i i do believe that it's one of the big challenges for abf and mm -hmm. and the whole hospital sector because we need we need more virtual care but we need to define um what is virtual care yeah, that's a good point. Let's open it up. So anyone on the panel, what is virtual care? Wow. <laughs> I would love you to give me an answer. <laughs> and that's why we, we get in there. Come on, Brian. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, no, we, I mean, obviously, um, I suppose that the COVID um, experience would have certainly led to more virtual outpatient clinics. Um, and indeed, that's certainly something that we've kind of had to change our uh, outpatient classification for. Um, one of the challenges it brings is, is um, you know, particularly if, if you've got one patient in one hospital and the consultant is in another hospital, we get into the argument over who gets who gets credit for the activity because the patient will be recorded in the in the hospital where he he attends, not in the hospital where the the consultant is um, is is carrying out the um, the, the the clinic. Um, but certainly, I, I, I think, you know, it is it is the way forward. And I, I think one thing coming out of COVID is that things from a, from a technical perspective or an IT perspective that would have taken maybe three to four years previously um, were able to ha happen in three to four weeks. Um, so I think COVID has kind of brought about, you know, um, you know, what, what we can do it, not why can't we do it, um, certainly way of thinking. Um, but it is still very, very new, but it is is, is the way forward. And we, we have some proposals, um, even in our table for funding around heart failure and whether, you know, the use of apps and, and how they can, you know, uh, save people both in, in terms of outpatients uh, and indeed, um, you know, uh, hospital admissions. Um, so I, I think it's certainly the way forward. And I think, as I say, that the developments from, from a COVID perspective and how things were able to move so quickly will assist in that process. I'm glad that uh, someone put a good spin on COVID, that it was used for something. And uh, certainly <laughs> is helpful for us too because we did experience some significant improvement in our data uh, in our innovation and in particular around, you know, telestroke. But uh, we have the last three minutes and I'm mindful that I do have a final question for the panelists. So anyone who will chip in, what are your top two priorities in your country for the longer term in relation of case mix? Any volunteers? Yeah. Well, we're uh, Okay, go on, Pernille. Pernille. come on, turn me off first. Well, we're Pernille, finding Pernille. the right balance between the, the quality of care uh, and a case mix and ABF. Uh, that's one of our big challenges um, because we we see now that that uh, ABF has sort of uh, yeah, given us a bad quality of care. Um, but we need to find the right balance because we're not abandoning case mix as a measurement tool. Um, so we still need case mix, but we also need uh, better quality of care. And that's our biggest challenge right now. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so so uh, briefly, just uh, following female uh, in, in the same concept, uh, uh, we're about to um, um, uh, uh, create um, um, uh, a new classification for uh, non-admitted uh, settings like outpatient ER and so on, uh, uh, that basically captures the outcomes. This is the the, the mm -hmm. main purpose of it. Um, so yeah, following the female uh, in the same concept. I this is what. Uh, there, if, yeah, if you get there, I'm sure you'll be able to sell the classification to everyone else. Let's go to the next one because I need to leave some time to yeah. James. Brian. Just from our perspective, it's moving into the community. Our, our, our health policy at the moment, we have an all-party all policy called Slauncher Care, uh, which is a shift left policy from the hospitals into the community. So we've been asked to, to get involved in costing in the community, which is a very wide area. But again, um, we're also moving to regional health authorities um, to some more integrated right. care. So, so I guess the community area um, is, okay. is what we're looking at. No, that is challenging right. everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Alpha, um, I've got 47 seconds before I get cut <laughs> off for the night. So can I say that's uh, been an absolutely fantastic uh, panel session. It's really good to see a couple of prior PCSI conference organisers on the line and, and the organiser for this year's as well. Uh, I think we should all have some sort of badge. 
Uh, that's it for today. That's a wrap for day one. Uh, we're back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, with two plenary uh, speakers, our second panel discussion, and our final keynote speaker. There'll also be some more concurrent Q and A sessions. I hope you've enjoyed today as much as we have. Uh, please make sure you complete the survey on the way out of the session, and we'll see you all in the morning. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone.